The following is a presentation on post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, by Penny Fossman, Diana Thornburg, and Jackie Wellborn. The presentation will include a case review and treatment plan for a patient with PTSD. The patient is a 32-year-old female who is new to the clinic. She was diagnosed with PTSD around age 23. Patient has a history of being gang, gang raped in college after an episode of heavy drinking while in college. The patient remembers being repeatedly raped for several hours and thinks she was also drugged. She then dropped out of college and never reported the incident. The patient now experiences hyperarousal with nightmares, insomnia, and nervousness. Flashbacks and re-experiencing re of the events, including hearing men's laughter in her home. Avoidance and numbing, including avoiding crowds, television shows, college campuses, and college-aged men. The patient has been married and divorced two times. She has no children. Her parents and siblings are educated and productive. She's employed by her mother in a socially isolated and independent work environment. She drinks one bottle of wine nightly. The patient is not currently taking any medications. There is no current or past history of cardiovascular, renal, hepatic, or neurological disorder. Current labs are unremarkable and include a CBC, liver panel, and drug toxicology. Post-traumatic stress disorder develops following an emotional trauma and is characterized by the recurrence of intrusive memories, avoidance, and hyperarousal. It affects about 8% of Americans at some time in their lives, and it can be a lifelong problem for many trauma victims. Brain regions hypothesized to play an important role in PTSD include the hippocampus, amygdala, and medial prefrontal cortex. Cortisol and norepinephrine are two neurochemicals that are critical in the stress response. Preclinical and clinical studies have shown alterations in memory function following traumatic stress, as well as changes in brain circuits and areas, including the hippocampus, amygdala, and medial prefrontal cortex. These areas mediate alterations in memory. The hippocampus, a brain area involved in verbal declarative memory, is very sensitive to the effects of stress. Stress in animals is associated with damage to neurons in the hippocampus and inhibition of neurogenesis. This may be mediated by hypercortisolemia decreased brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and or elevated glutamate levels. High levels of cortisol seen with stress are also associated with deficits in new learning. A combination of environmental and genetic factors leads to deficits in hippocampal function and structure. In addition to the hippocampus, other brain structures have been implicated in a neural circuitry of stress including the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is involved in memory for the emotional valence of events and plays a critical role in the acquisition of fear responses. The medial prefrontal cortex includes the anterior cingulate gyrus, or Brodmann's area, and subcolossal gyrus, as well as the orbitofrontal cortex. Studies have demonstrated that the medial prefrontal cortex modulates emotional responsiveness through inhibition of amygdala function. Conditioned fear responses are extinguished following repeated exposure to the conditioned stimulus in the absence of the unconditioned stimulus. This inhibition, this inhibition appears to be mediated by medial prefrontal cortical inhibition of amygdala responsiveness. Exposure to chronic stress results in potentiation of noradrenergic responsiveness so to subsequent stressors and increased release of norepinephrine in the hippocampus and other brain regions. Cortisol release is enhanced due to the decreased regulation of the circuitry. Symptoms are hypothesized to represent the behavioral manifestations of stress-induced changes in brain structures and functions. Symptoms of PTSD include intrusive thoughts, hyperarousal and startle response, flashbacks, nightmares and sleep disturbances, and changes in memory and concentration. 
MRIs have shown smaller hippocampal volumes in people with PTSD. Smaller hippocampal volume appears to be associated with a range of trauma-related psychiatric disorders. Gilbertson hypothesized that there's a neuroprotective function associated with a large hippocampus that mitigates the development of PTSD, even in an individual that has been exposed to an unimaginable trauma. The larger hippocampus may be better able to limit the acquisition of haunting memories or, more, or be more efficient at extinguishing them once they develop. And twin studies have shown that the best predictor of a combat victim's vulnerability to PTSD is hippocampal size rather than exposure to trauma. Corticotropin releasing factor, or CRF, in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system, or the HPA axis, play an important role in the stress response. CRF is released from the hypothalamus with stimulation of adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, release from the pituitary, resulting in glucocorticoid, or cortisol, release from the adrenal gland. This in turn has a negative feedback effect on the axis at the level of the pituitary, as well as central brain sites, including the hypothalamus and hippocampus. Cortisol has a number of effects which facilitate survival. In addition to its role in triggering the HPA axis, cortisol acts centrally to mediate fear-related behaviors and triggers other neurochemical responses to stress, such as the, the noradrenergic system via the locus ceruleus, which is located in the brainstem. Norepinephrine stimulates the release of corticotropin-releasing hormone, which in turn activates the HPA axis. Peripheral norepinephrine produces somatic symptoms of anxiety, racing heart rate, sweating, and dry mouth. Elevated noradrenergic activity is associated with persistence and severity of PTSD symptoms. Increased noradrenergic activity during trauma has also been implicated in the enhancement of encoding of the memory for the traumatic event. However, clinical research indicates that the persistence and severity of PTSD symptoms is also associated with increased noradrenergic activity long after the traumatic event is over. It is possible that norepinephrine is involved not only in the original encoding, but also in the maintenance and exacerbation of symptoms associated with traumatic memories. Most clinical guidelines recommend SSRIs as a first-line treatment for PTSD. There are two SSRIs with, F with FDA approval for treatment of PTSD, and these include sertraline and paroxetine. Fluoxetine has an off-label indication for treatment of PTSD. SSRIs block the reabsorption or reuptake of serotonin in the brain, making more serotonin available. SSRIs are effective in minimizing PTSD symptoms of re-experience, avoidance, and numbing in addition to hyperarousal symptoms. The following table is a comparison of sertraline, paroxetine, and fluoxetine in the treatment of PTSD. The three medications show uh, similar symptom improvement and some differences in the side effect profile. Of note are that studies have shown that sertraline is to the most effective SSRI in the treatment of PTSD in women. In addition to SSRIs, prezosin, an alpha, ad alpha adrenergic antagonist, can be added as an adjunct in the treatment of PTSD. Prezosin is FDA approved for treatment of hypertension. However, it has been proven effective in off-label use for sleep disorders, including insomnia, nightmares, and hyperarousal in PTSD. Other adjunct medications and therapies useful in the treatment of PTSD include naltrexone for people who need help to minimize alcohol cravings, cognitive behavioral therapy, 
and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy are helpful as well. For the patient in the case study, initial treatment will include 25 milligrams every morning of sertraline for one week. During week two, the dose will be increased to 50 milligrams every morning. Further titration can be done as needed and will be increased in 50 milligram increments at weekly intervals. The therapeutic dosing range for this medication is 50 to 200 milligrams daily with a maximum dose of 200 milligrams daily. Some common side effects of sertraline include insomnia, nausea, diarrhea, and decreased appetite. The patient will be educated to take this medication in the morning. The patient in the case study will also be prescribed prezosin for nightmares. The initial dose will be one milligram one hour before bedtime every night. At the second week, the dose will be increased to two milligrams taken one hour before bedtime every night. If further titration is needed, the increases will be in one to two milligram increments at weekly intervals. The therapeutic dosing range is 1 to 15 milligrams. Side effects of prezosin include orthostatic hypotension, vertigo, palpitations, and sexual dysfunction. The patient will be educated to take this medication at bedtime, one hour before going to sleep, and due to the risk of orthostatic hypotension, the patient will be educated to change position slowly. The patient in this case study reports drinking one bottle of wine nightly and uh, reports worry about increasing cravings for alcohol. So she will also be pre prescribed naltrexone. Uh, the initial dose is 50 milligrams daily. This treatment will be continued for 12 weeks and the therapeutic dosing range is the 50 milligram dosage daily. Side effects of naltrexone um, there are quite a few. They include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, stomach pain and or cramping, decreased appetite, headaches, dizziness, nervousness, irritability, anxiety, and tearfulness, and increased or decreased energy. Uh, the patient will be instructed to report these symptoms if they are severe or if they persist. Some other general patient education points will be um, that it is very important for the patient to keep follow-up appointments. Um, if she doesn't keep follow-up appointments, the provider uh, will need to do close follow-up with the patient. Uh, she will be instructed not to not abruptly stop taking sertraline and that so thoughts of suicide may occur as she starts sertraline. This will need to be reported immediately. She'll be requ um, required to do some lab testing and baseline vital signs prior to starting treatment with these medications and a urine pregnancy test will also be required.